Welcome to In Studio with Sharna Bobi. This is a series of conversations with artists, curators, and influencers, particularly in, but not limited to the African arts. I named it In Studio, with the studio as a broad term, referring to the artist's working space and the mental space for making and creating. I'm very passionate about how art can stimulate open-minded conversation, and I hope these episodes challenge you to see the world in new ways. Lena Iris Victor is a dynamic conceptual performance artist and painter who lives and works between New York and London. Born in Britain to Liberian parents, Lena spent many of her earlier years in South Africa. With a bold visual appeal and strong thematic messaging, her work has attracted a sizable following on social media, and Lena recently had her first UK solo exhibition at London's Amar Gallery. If you're unfamiliar with Lena's work, I would first recommend a visit to our Instagram page at InStudio with SO to see some pictures. Lena merges photography, performance, and abstract painting to form dark canvases embedded with layers of light in the form of gilded 24 karat gold. This creates a beautifully mesmerizing connotation on the concept of blackness, which Lena explains in this episode. Among others, she has exhibited at Harvard Art Museums and the Cooper Gallery, the Kentucky Museum of Arts and Crafts, and Spelman Museum of Fine Art. Having closely followed her career online, I was delighted to finally get the chance to see her work firsthand. So we sat down one Sunday afternoon at Somerset House to chat about her journey. How would you introduce yourself? Good question. Um, I'm an artist. I, I guess I would call myself a conceptual artist mm -hmm. uh, because I always say that regardless of whatever medium I'm using, the concept is kind of what reigns. Mm -hmm. um, I work across performance, painting, some would say I'm multidisciplinary, mm -hmm. don't really like all those words, I'm yeah. just an artist. Mm -hmm. Um, as for all the other taglines that are like all the prefixes that people love to tag along as well as like British Liberian artist <laughs> uh, or Liberian artist or sometimes American artist yeah. um, for me I'm just purely an artist mm -hmm. not a female artist just an artist do labels bother you? yes they're very confining and constricting and reductive mm -hmm. because the, the, the whole purpose of a label is to try to make somebody understand you and what you do mm -hmm. and it's just not that easy mm -hmm. to understand people and what they do and why they do what they do so it's kind of um, yeah it's kind of uh, like I said reductive and just a little bit lazy I think mm -hmm. to always want to label things just to try to just make it smaller to make it compute in mm -hmm. people's minds okay that's very interesting. Because <laughs> I, I do understand. I think when you deal with a lot of work and artists, sometimes people just want to, like you said, it, it, it seems lazy because they want to classify them and mm -hmm. kind of group them and, and summarize what they are about. But I think that artists are much more complex and complicated mm -hmm. than that. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it might be about understanding their background and using it as a starting point. Right. But I understand that it can be very... I don't think really, that's usually yeah. how it is used, though. I feel like mm -hmm. it's used to better gauge or try to understand, like you said, where they're coming from. Mm -hmm. um, if you were to say I'm British Liberian, that has a very particular context and connotation. Mm -hmm. But to be honest, like I've traveled a lot of places, so my national identity or where mm -hmm. I've grown up mm -hmm. obviously bears significance in my work, but then so does everything else. Mm -hmm. So it, again, I just find it very restrictive and confining mm -hmm. just to say that because people automatically create an idea in their head as to what that means mm -hmm. and I don't really feel like it's my job to have to redefine their stereotypes mm -hmm. although it kind of falls on us to do that all the time yeah. especially when you're talking about African or African diasporic artists mm -hmm. we're constantly put in that position where we have to clarify our agendas as artists in a mm -hmm. way that I don't think other artists have to mm -hmm. so I don't really feel like it's necessary for mm -hmm. me. I, I understand why people do it and mm -hmm. I understand that I won't ever escape it. Mm -hmm. You either play with it or embrace it, um, but it's not the most favorite thing. Okay. On that note, having mentioned her hybrid cultural identity, I was curious to know more about Lena's travels to understand the context of her experiences. Now, at this point in our conversation, an airplane was flying just above us. It could be great timing, or 
terrible timing as I felt at the time, but I think it sets the scene, don't you think? What are some of the, you said you've lived in different places, so what are, what are some, the noise is really bothering me. <laughs> um, what are some of the places that you've lived, um, that you said that you've traveled around in? Um, I mean, I travel a lot. I've lived between America, Johannesburg, and London. Um, I grew up in London until I was 16, but my parents moved to Joburg when I was about 11 or so. Mm -hmm. So I would spend a better part of three months every summer in Johannesburg for about four or five years. Mm -hmm. So I kind of lived in, I, I consider that living in Johannesburg. They lived there. I would go see them all the time. Um, and then I moved to New York. I've been kind of in the States for the last 14 years or so. Mm -hmm. Um, I moved there when I was 16, and and now I'm looking to relocate somewhere new. Ooh! <laughs> so and, and I have no idea yet what that place is. Are you looking for ideas? Ideas. <laughs> that's why I'm, that's why I've been doing far more traveling recently. I'm trying to see like where would I really want to kind of yeah. create a home base. It's not going to be in, back in London. It's not going to be in yeah. an urban environment. I kind of wanting the antithesis of that right now. I'm yeah. wanting peace, quiet, tranquility nature, mm -hmm. looking at the ocean, mm -hmm. having a studio in that kind of space. So yeah. I'm looking at places kind of off the beaten path. Mm. I'll think of something so I can come up with ideas for you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and so how has your experience living in these different cities informed who you are and your artist practice? Um, I mean, I can't say because of my kind of the fractured kind of experience I've had with Liberia. My parents left before I was born. Mm -hmm. um, and it was traumatic for them, I'm sure, as it was for most people leaving at the time. So I feel like they had, they created a kind of an emotional chasm with them where they mm -hmm. didn't really want to. I grew up knowing my culture, but it was, you know, all those kind of colloquialisms and kind of small and narratives and stories, they weren't mm -hmm. really addressed. Mm -hmm. um, so it's kind of led me to a place now where as when I first started in my practice I was making work that was far more I would say universal in scope and mm -hmm. much more of a universal conversation about the nature of being and and you know the cosmos and our place within it which are valid stories and I don't think that the work I do doesn't have that narrative in it still but it's become far more topical mm -hmm. now about um, my heritage mm -hmm. At the end of the day, I'm Liberian, but I'm African, mm -hmm. so it doesn't really, like, I'm not trying to, you know, seg further segment and, like, you know, divide the, the continent, mm -hmm. um, but Liberia's story is very particular and mm -hmm. very interesting and very under underrepresented, I think, mm -hmm. um, and most people, especially African Americans, who have such a, a crazy tie to Liberia, mm -hmm. have no idea of, of, that, of that narrative. Mm -hmm. um, it's kind of been very much downplayed and quashed, and so... If I can do anything as a Liberian artist mm -hmm. to, you know, further excavate and or kind of create a narrative around that whole, the founding of Liberia, how it came to be, why it's in the situation it is in today, mm -hmm. um, to clarify to people, because obviously the very easy kind of read of Liberia is just to say it's just a place in like a post-war chaos and turmoil, politically corrupt, all yeah. the usual, you know, stereotypes that go along with most of these African nations, yeah. right? But that's, but there's a reason why it is what it is today. Mm -hmm. And that reason has a lot to do with America's hand in the founding of Liberia. Mm -hmm. And people don't really know that story. Mm -hmm. I think it's very important for African Americans in that story because mm -hmm. they are the people that went back to Liberia. They were the, the they were actually the first kind of back to Africa movement, pre-Marcus mm -hmm. Garvey and, you know, the whole Pan-African Africanist ideologies of the 20th century, that happened before that, mm -hmm. and it was somewhat successful until mm -hmm. it fell apart. <laughs> uh, so Liberia used to yeah. be a paradise in the West, when you know, in Western Africa. So that story, I think, needs to have a light shot on it, and mm -hmm. I'd rather be the person to do it than some mm -hmm. non-national or some other person, you know? So yeah. in a way, my work is becoming far more topical and far more political for that reason, because mm -hmm. I think they're narratives that need to be kind of dredged up mm -hmm. and discussed because they are as pertinent today mm -hmm. as they were then. And I feel like people don't see that correlation, but there's mm -hmm. a very clear correlation between what's going on in America today and what's happening in Liberia and the whole colonial project of the West. And all of these things are all very interlo interlocked mm -hmm. and kind of uh, domino effect. Mm -hmm. So are these some of the themes that you explore in your work? What are the themes that are important to you when you're creating new work? I mean, the recent works, let's say for the last two years or so, I've been creating exclusively black and gold works. Um, and the reason for that is because I wanted to kind of create the most minimalist palette to have the kind of most impactful conversation mm -hmm. around the universal implications of blackness. Mm -hmm. So to me, it's not even, I mean, race is derivative of that conversation, mm -hmm. but it's not 
the the leading conversation I'm mm -hmm. having. The conversation I'm having is about how we as, as as human beings have come to understand blackness. And if you were to, for example, go into you know Webster dictionary or Google it or whatever, mm -hmm. and you put in the word black and you see the words and the synonyms that mm -hmm. come up that are mm -hmm. in correlation with black, they're mm -hmm. all very dark. They're all very dirt. It's, it's about dirtiness and darkness and evil and like you know just all things that are very negative. Mm -hmm. um, and that is a conditioning. Mm -hmm. And this, as all languages, it's mm -hmm. a conditioning, and it happened that way for a reason. Mm -hmm. When you look up white, it's all about purity and ang angelic things and angels and, you know, God, and, and mm -hmm. black is the opposite. And mm -hmm. the reason why that's so dangerous is because as people of color, mm -hmm. people with melanin, whatever you want to call it, mm -hmm. on this planet, we are referred to by most, as black. <laughs> so think about the, 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 the emotional implications of yeah. that, the psychological implications of that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I've spoken to curators of major institutions here who like do like, for example, like all black shows, like the way I do my show mm -hmm. in, in Amar, um, and have had real pushback in from doing that because apparently people aren't ready for that. Mm. You know, that's a real conversation we're having. Yeah. having. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it makes um, you. It makes you seem and feel invisible right. when you can't even address the things that are relevant to you. Right. So my project, at least for now as an artist, is to say, well, hey, if I can renegotiate, reposition the way we look at black in a universal way, mm -hmm. then it will have a trickle-down effect mm -hmm. into all the other kind of connotations and mm -hmm. negative kind of, um, you know, I guess, like, manifestations of that word, which is including that of race. Mm -hmm. um, so I created a completely so black box show mm -hmm. with all black and gold works. Mm -hmm. um, gold being, to me, like a source of light in of itself. Mm -hmm. So it's this, and it's obviously, you know, it's an otherworldly kind of godlike metal as far as I'm concerned. It's immortal because it doesn't rust, doesn't tarnish. It's, it's the most stable metal. It's still the softest metal, but the most stable metal. Mm -hmm. We've lauded it and kind of put it in this glor glorious positioning as human beings since it's, you know, since we found it mm -hmm. and um, we have this storied history with gold. Mm -hmm. So it's like taking this, the, the most primal matter, I think, mm -hmm. you know, blackness, the void, this idea that from blackness is birthed everything mm -hmm. from the blackness of, you know, the, the Big Bang Theory, right? Like, you know, we came, if you look, if you watch that show, The Cosmos, I think it's the Carl Sagan show or the one mm -hmm. with... Uh, Morgan Freeman narrating it. He's, they say in the beginning there was nothing and then bang, right? Mm -hmm. But nothing can come from nothing. Mm -hmm. But the nothing they're speaking of is this void, this blackness. Mm -hmm. So blackness is the materia prima. Mm -hmm. It's the first matter. It's the primal matter mm -hmm. from which everything is born. Mm -hmm. So I kind of want to play on that idea. Mm -hmm. And then the gold represents like the... I mean, it's never like so simple as it represents this, mm -hmm. but in a very kind of simplistic way, the gold is the, the light in that darkness, mm -hmm. right? Of which gold has been, you know, stolen from the continent and mm -hmm. like... We've had, I mean, a, a big part of why so many, uh, you know, like why South Africa was colonized and why a lot of Western Africa was colonized was because of our gold reserves mm -hmm. and because of the gold and all yeah. the other resources that we had, mm -hmm. a primary one being gold. Mm -hmm. And um, and so we as Africans have a very storied history with gold as mm -hmm. well. So it's working on many levels. The mm -hmm. work's working on a very kind of universal blackness kind of conversation. It's working on the level of who are we within this? Mm -hmm. We are the materia prima within mm -hmm. this entire societal structure that we have kind of orchestrated, yet we have, got, we have been given the lowest rung on the ladder. Yeah. So it's like, how do you reinstate, reposition, make it like, also beauty is a tool. Like I use beauty, like the aesthetic beauty of works as a tool mm -hmm. to draw people into thinking it's just something beautiful, but mm -hmm. actually b below all those layers of just the, aesthetic, you know, like, I guess, pleasing nature of the work, mm -hmm. there's a real political agenda of reframing for them, like, what they what they kind of will connote or kind of refer to as mm -hmm. beautiful. Wow. Because, you know, it's yeah. just a re-education as far as I'm concerned. You sound like you're very much into philosophy, mm -hmm. are you? Mm -hmm. Philosophy and history. Mm -hmm. Who are some of the thought leaders that you found really interesting as you've done your research? Um, you know, like the revolutionaries, like the pan africanist revolutionaries, <laughs> Sankara, Nkrumah, obviously Marcus Garvey, you know, you read Malcolm X and, mm -hmm. um, you know, a lot of research in the Black Panther Party and kind of the mis misrepresentation of that mm -hmm. even to this day. Yeah. Um, you know, I was reading a lot of, of source material like that. I was looking to like old um, publications that were created like as the kind of... Um, the antithesis of what the the Western or I guess the more um, mainstream dialogues around blackness were. So mm -hmm. a lot of these like 
publications like Black World that came up and Negro Chronicles and Negro mm -hmm. Journal, all these things. Not because I want to exist in a time warp, mm -hmm. because I know that things have progressed mm -hmm. in a way, you mm -hmm. know? I know that things have progressed since that point, but mm -hmm. there was a real seed of like, of something that was, that was again, another dream deferred that mm -hmm. happened in that whole period of time mm -hmm. in the 60s in America and the 70s in Britain, mm -hmm. um, the kind of revolts and the kind of, uh, you know, fighting for a sense of equality, which I don't really even think will ever exist, to be honest. But like, you know, yeah. in this paradigm, no. Yeah. Um, but, you know, this, this sincere wanting and, and desire for an equal playing field mm -hmm. is, I think, still a common conversation that mm -hmm. we are trying to have to this day. Mm -hmm. We just garb it and we just put in different garb and different clothing and different words and we just make it look so different. But really, it's the same conversation they've been having for the last 50, 60 years. Yeah. So that's why I'm looking at that source material. Mm -hmm. The reason I'm looking at all these kind of presidents and our freedom fighters or like people like Haile Selassie, like, you know, people that were in power in the 70s and the 80s is because that was their project, too. Mm -hmm. It was to kind of create a very strong solidarity amongst Africans. Mm -hmm so that we could do for ourselves and not be reliant upon external forces to support our own ideas and our own genders, our own dreams. Mm -hmm. So that's why I'm looking at, at those kind of thinkers. Um, I definitely would say they were thinkers before they were even political leaders. Mm -hmm. uh, they had a very particular agenda and story and narrative they had They had to, they felt, and that's why they, they got assassinated for it, many yeah. of them. You know, actually most of them got assassinated yeah. for it. Um, because it was, it was going against the grain of what was accepted for what, and where we, where society thought we could be, you yeah. know? Um, so I'm going to keep pushing at that. Yeah. Yeah. At which point did you decide that you wanted to be an artist? Because it sounds like you have a message and you have, you know, these thoughts that you want to share with the world. And so when did you realize that you wanted to use art to convey these ideas? I don't know if the art came for the idea, the idea came for the art, because yeah. I feel like... I grew up in London, it's very kind of on the, this veneer of like racial equality, this veneer of political equality, of like, you know, political correctness and all these things. And under the surface is just yep. rife with yep. all of those like yep. ambiguities and contradictions, right? Yep. Yep. But I lived in that bubble for a long time mm -hmm. and I believed that bubble for a long time. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh, we're all the same, no, no problem, <laughs> Nothing, you know. It's all class here, it's not about race, it's about class. Yeah. <laughs> and. Um, and then I went to America and had the sincerest culture shock of my life, <laughs> which kind of was great. It was hard, but it was great because what it did is it led me to kind of do my due diligence. Mm -hmm. So most of the animosity or kind of issues I dealt with moving to America weren't from white Americans or from African Americans mm -hmm. because of all the kind of, I guess, baggage on their shoulders from their history, which didn't apply to my history. Mm -hmm. So I didn't come with the same baggage mm -hmm. and I didn't come with, therefore, the same sense of... of othering. Mm -hmm. I didn't other myself. And mm -hmm. I feel like that's a very much a psycho psychological makeup of a lot of African Americans to other themselves from whatever this mainstream idea of what they want to be part of is. Mm -hmm. So because of that, I was vilified, right? Mm -hmm. And which most people are when they move to states who mm -hmm. are not part of that whole conversation. Mm -hmm. And what it did was it forced me in college to kind of start taking all these classes, like the psychology of race and ethnicity in America. And then it led me down the whole rabbit, rabbit hole of like, well, America was the founding, the African Americans were the founders of this place I come from, Liberia. Mm -hmm. And it's just this like domino effect. Mm -hmm. As time has gone on, and, like, and that was when I wasn't even practicing visual arts per se, I was practicing film. Um, I did a lot of photography and film and design. And this, I guess, iteration of my... I've always been in the arts, I've always done theater performance, all these things mm -hmm. since I was a kid. So this iteration is just really the amalgamation of all those things mm -hmm. that I've kind of accrued over the last decade and a half or so. Mm -hmm. And the clearer my intent as an artist grew, the, the more succinct my work became. Mm -hmm. So it happened together. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, I can't say one came before the other. Mm -hmm. I think they both grew together. Mm -hmm. My ability to, at the point that I'm in my career now, like my ability to kind of um, create things I feel are impactful mm -hmm. come from this place of me having something very impactful to say mm -hmm. and trying to make it as neutral as possible. Mm -hmm. Not because I don't want to offend, because I have no problem with offending people. <laughs> it's because I want it to hit the most people as possible because I believe in subliminal messaging mm -hmm. that is positive. Mm -hmm. I believe in subliminal messaging that's negative, but mm -hmm. I believe in subliminal messaging that's very positive. Mm -hmm. And when you see a lot of black people like rally around the work and, and have these very, very um, emotive and sincere reactions mm -hmm. to it, it's because I believe it's, it's scratching at things that are in their DNA that mm -hmm. are dormant or have been dormant to them. Mm -hmm. It's awakening something that is like a truth that they have almost not known mm -hmm. and so it's like the spark mm -hmm. and if I can be that spark for people to 
awaken and see what is, what their potential really is, mm -hmm. what our potential as Africans or black people in the you know, diaspora, whatever. If I can be at any level of spark for that, then mm -hmm. job done. Yeah. You know? Wow. You're absolutely brilliant. <laughs> I think you're brilliant. I think one of the things I also really like about you is how you've been able to promote yourself on social media mm -hmm. and to convey your messages through the image. Right. Can you talk a bit more about that, about how you've used digital media to create a platform for yourself and a space where you can you know, provide what you like mm -hmm. to share with the world? Because it's, I think social media allows you to create a space where you might not already have that space. Right. And so being able to do that very effectively is actually a very important skill. I have a love-hate with social media. I know its merit and its worth in terms of hitting the most people possible, and I know that it's also at the same time can be very toxic. Yeah. However, I do not buy into nor support the elitist structures of the art worlds. Mm -hmm. Do I play within those worlds? 100%. <laughs> but I don't support it. And so in that way that I have this very egalitarian viewpoint of art is for people. Mm -hmm. It's not for the people that you allow into these spaces mm -hmm. or feel comfortable entering these spaces after you've already ousted them from these spaces. Mm -hmm. And it's usually our people that are not very comfortable in these spaces. Yeah. <laughs> so the best way to actually have the most kind of traction, the most, the most reach is to not just show in museums and in galleries. It's lovely to do so. Mm -hmm. And I understand its merit and its importance for the idea of provenance and creating, you know, longevity and, a, and an oeuvre of work that is, you know, as, as competitive as any of the other masters of greats. Mm -hmm. But at the core of it, many artists are missing the point mm -hmm. by not having that conversation on a social level, mm -hmm. on a level where anybody can enter the conversation and mm -hmm. say whatever they want to say and have their say. And even if they can experience in the physical dimension, because most people, ironically, and not even ironically, because I think about how much art I've seen, mm -hmm. and I've seen a lot of art, but most people that I love, I've seen hardly any of their work in person, like mm -hmm. literally in person. I've seen, I've made it my, my job to do that now, but, yeah. but I understand that most people are consuming art in this digital way. Yeah. They have no idea of the tactile nature, the physicality of these works they're looking at. It's all very two-dimensional. Mm -hmm. However, even in that experience, mm -hmm. If people can be touched, then again, mm -hmm. the work is the the, work, the job's been done, mm -hmm. and if and that can also lead people to want to to like further investigate or to want to come out to a gallery mm -hmm. to like actually pr pr like give them uh, motivation to enter museum spaces mm -hmm. because they see someone that like, that's just like them doing the same thing, mm -hmm. then again, job done. Mm -hmm. It's like all of these things are all like social media is a tool. It's a mm -hmm. tool to yes yeah, show what I'm doing and all these things, but it's moreover a tool to reach the most people to to like actually like push them into these spaces mm -hmm. where they where I feel like they feel like they've been ostracized mm -hmm. they don't have a voice within it mm -hmm. and it's like no it's actually you do and you can mm -hmm. and you and these and these are the ways that I've done it mm -hmm. you know and so I always look to my older peers people that I really respect mm -hmm. to figure out how they did it mm -hmm. and you're never going to do it the same way but yeah. it's definitely an education mm -hmm. so as a younger person, I'm not like a, I'm not a mid-career or super established artist. As a younger person that's still making inroads, if other people who are younger or around my age range can see that and want to and figure they can do the same thing, mm -hmm. again, job mm -hmm. done. And that's it. and you can't do that in these ostentatious and super elitist spaces. You yeah. have to do it at a ground level, at a yeah. grassroots level, and that's what social media offers mm -hmm. me and offers most artists that like really use it as in that way. Yeah, It's that accessibility through right. digital media. I think when you say this, I, th I think of you know the Tumblr crowd who, you know, there are all these Tumblr pages with lots of art and, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's an, a movement that's going on between, you know, among the younger generation of people. Mm -hmm. And when I encountered your work, it was online as well. It was also mm -hmm. in social media. And then I heard about your exhibition. Of course, I had to come see it. So I think what you're saying is also true from my experience as well because I saw your work in the digital media but then when I got to see it in person I got to see the detail and you can't really get an appreciation of that you know in yeah. the pictures but when you see it in person I think it also elevates and um, expands your appreciation of the work. Right. Can you tell me a bit more about your process in terms of actually making the work and what that's like for you? The feedback I get a lot in, for this show in London, which is hilarious, is because it doesn't, it doesn't even cross my mind, because obviously I live and breathe these works, yeah. is that, oh, I didn't know these works are, had, were like three-dimensional. I didn't know that they had the sculpture. I thought they were just flat works. Yeah. And that's like such a huge component of my work. It's mm -hmm. like all the work comes off the canvas, you mm -hmm. know? So I think that's really funny that that's like the, the takeaway a lot of people say who have experienced my work only in the two-dimensional mm -hmm. way. 
you know, I use gilding as a central part of my practice. It's water gilding, which is like a, it's a version of water gilding because mm-hmm. water gilding in its traditional sense, it goes back, you know, to, to the medieval times, if not before, mm-hmm. uh, in terms of European art. And it's a process that they usually do on wood panels. And you have to use something that's non-porous, a substrate that's non-porous. So I'm gilding on canvas and paper, which is supremely porous. Mm-hmm. So I have to do different, I have to use different kind of techniques to to basically base or prime the works before I can actually start gilding. So yeah, I do, that's my main practice. In the last two years, I've been doing mostly black and gold paints, like I said. There mm-hmm. were there were a whole slew of paintings with like, you know, the Majorelle Blue or Eve's Clan Blue, blue. however oh. you, whatever you want to call it, <laughs> yeah. which will be revisited yeah. in the future. But this is a... This 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 like iteration of works is very much with like I said earlier a very clear mm-hmm. message and so even this being the first act in London, mm-hmm. the way that I f- conceive of this playing out in three acts is the next show will be in New York next year, and then the last show will be on the continent. Yes. So it's like this triangle, mm-hmm. right? Which again is part of the narrative, mm-hmm. and it will only really make sense to people when they've seen the entire iteration of everything as it unfolded. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, so basically the, the gilding is my central part, and uh, the works are all very sculptural. So I build off the canvas or off the paper. So there's a three dimensionality to the work. So I look at them as almost sculptural paintings. Mm-hmm. And then I've also created a series of works in this show, um, a diptych, loosely diptych, mm-hmm. um, of translucent works. So mm-hmm. basically this. The works no longer the works exist as a sculpture now, not just as a as a painting. They're suspended. Mm-hmm. The frame of the the support, which is the frame where the structure of the work is visible, it's actually cut to mm-hmm. be visible, mm-hmm. and it's gilded on top. So these layers upon layers of blackness, basically, it's black frame, black fabric, black acrylic, and then the gold. It's like these layers of black and gold, basically, mm-hmm. and different translucencies. I call them the resonances of black, right? So that's a whole new kind of iteration because mostly the works were very kind of opaque and like just purely black and gold. There were no other kind of differences in terms of finishes. Yeah, you had mattes and like, I guess, resin or, sh- or shinier refractive mm-hmm. areas. But this is like a, a whole new iteration mm-hmm. and a whole new way of showing work and positioning work. So that's where I'm kind of going with the next nice. couple of the shows as well. So in a lot of your works, there are, there's always a female figure that's in the center of it. Does she represent anything? Is she you or is she <laughs> the woman? I mean, I mean, when they're not abstracted forms, yeah. they are they are my body, but yeah. like they're not about they're not self portraits. Okay, and I think that's a lot, a lot of people get <laughs> get like confused and like, they're not because self portraits to me the whole purpose of a self portrait is about revealing things about yourself to yourself in the process of doing something that would kind of take you out of your comfort zone, right? Yeah. But it's meant to be revelatory. It's also meant to be revelatory for the viewer to like, you know, when Frida Kahlo painted herself portraits, yeah. they were about her story and like pulling things out of her that she couldn't necessarily speak or evoke in other ways. Mm-hmm. That's not the purpose of my work. My works are very performative. Mm-hmm. They are meant to represent a universal being, mm-hmm. not even about woman and man, although mm-hmm. obviously it has more of a feminine you know, but the blackness and the abstractness of it too, it just morphs it so it becomes something other mm-hmm. because it's meant to be a much more universal kind of uh, body than it is mm-hmm. about me or about womanhood or any of those mm-hmm. things, even though a lot of people think it's about womanhood. <laughs> it is, I mean, it's about a lot of things and it's really whatever people think it is as well. I yeah. kind of give people the, the, t- the credit to, to have their own opinions but for me personally as the creator it's, it's not really about any of those things. Okay. To close, mm-hmm. Is there anything else you want to share that you think people should know about you or your work or what's um, important to you? <laughs> I think I've spread a lot about what's important to me. I have, view, I have viewpoints. I'm not going yeah. anywhere. I have a, like I said, a love-hate with this whole kind of art world structures and, and I hope throughout my career to further push at the fabric of those things, yeah. those givens, I think, that are... You know, even the people I work with or chosen to work with, they're all in their own own rights, um, contrarian to a way. You know, mm-hmm. I'm not contrarian for the sake of being contrarian, mm-hmm. but because there has to, there has to be other ways of doing things that are far more kind of relevant and impactful, and not just you know expecting that we must always do this thing, do things this particular way, and that's the only way people can ever consume something. I think that it's interesting to be kind of a renegade in the art world. It's interesting mm-hmm. to kind of be a radical thinker. Mm-hmm. And that's what artists should be anyway, mm-hmm. inherently. I don't know artists that, why would artists ever want to not be radical? Mm-hmm. Or just test, you know? So that's kind of my position, and it probably will always be my position. Yeah. And yeah, and uh, I'm very excited for 2018. I have a lot of things coming in 2018. Nice in the States mainly, but also other, like Mexico and other places, so. 
Yeah, nice. I mean, just uh, keep it, keeping it moving. Yeah, the future is bright. <laughs> the future is bright. <laughs> Thank you, Lena, for being on the podcast. Thank you so much for having me, Sharon. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for listening to In Studio with Sharon Bobby, which this week featured the insightful Lena Iris Victor. In the next episode, I talk to Ibrahim Mahama, an emerging Ghanaian artist whose work is making waves internationally. Don't forget to subscribe to get the latest updates. And keep in touch on Instagram and Twitter. You can find us at InStudio with SO.